I'm sure many of you know, many big companies, including Google, Dell, PayPal, Cisco, Intel, Microsoft, SP, <coughs> and many others, have long utilized corporate investing to generate healthy returns on their investments and all going strategic insights and advantages. And while many companies pulled back after 2000, uh, when the bubble <coughs> burst, there's recently been a strong resurgence in corporate venture funds. By some estimates, more than half of Fortune 1000 companies now have dedicated corporate venture arms or a strategy, and according to PricewaterhouseCoopers, they were involved in around 15% of venture funding in 2011, contributed around 8% of venture capital during that time. So the four people here from some very prominent firms represent probably getting close to a billion dollars of potential venture capital. And these are really interesting people to hear from. <laughs> <laughs> so before we get into that, I'd like to have them introduce themselves. So if you care to start here, Debbie, would you care to introduce them? Just a couple of minutes if you're Thanks. Hi everybody, uh, Debbie Brackeen. I'm Managing Director and Head of Incubation for City Ventures. So that's the corporate venturing arm of Citigroup, Citibank, uh, a large global bank that you may have heard of. Um, and City Ventures is a little bit different perhaps than some corporate venture groups in that we cover the whole span of innovation. We report to the Chief Innovation Officer of the company and uh, we have a whole innovation, uh, agenda to drive innovation across the firm in addition to investing in startups and incubating new businesses internally within the company. Uh, my background is all in the Valley for the last 20 some odd years, 10 years at Apple, uh, eBay, some startups along the way, uh, and most uh, prior to joining City about a year and a half ago, I ran Ventures at HP for about four years, and I was there for seven years. Thank you. Please, Andrew. Yeah. Hey, I'm uh, Drew Clark from IBM, and uh, about uh, 12 years ago, co-founded co the, uh, the venture group there. And uh, we report up through corporate strategy, so we're really a strategic arm of IBM's uh, machinery. And um, perhaps different from other, other funds, um, certainly different from funds uh, that you might find in the venture community, but probably also from here. We're not investing capital directly, but rather um, we are really looking for great partnerships to help drive top-line growth with IBM. And uh, so we're thinking of us more as kind of an incubator, accelerator, mentoring kind of uh, opportunity. Uh, we do like kind investments, so we're interested also in working with you to help you uh, grow and help provide you with the tools and support that you need. Uh, we also work, um, as Deborah said, across the company to try to help drive innovation to the various business units and, and brands and so forth. And so we really are kind of considered a, an extension of, um, of, of each of the brand's own strategy team as we kind of look for gap fillers and opportunities to kind of uh, tr grow the business. True. Thank you, Drew. Sure. Patrick. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Patrick Egan, I'm with Qualcomm Ventures, half billion dollar fund of Qualcomm. Qualcomm, uh, leading wireless chipset designer in the world. Uh, we are effectively, just to sort of compare, I guess, ecosystem investors. We invest all across the wireless ecosystem from classic sort of infrastructure device all the way down the value chain, handset supply, software services, apps, enabling technologies, uh, orthogonal categories such as healthcare, clean tech, life sciences, connected devices. Uh, wireless has broadened dramatically over the last five years, so that, uh, that has helped sort of expand our target universe. Um, we are, I, I actually run our seed program at early stage, sort of seed and series A. I am based in the Bay Area. I uh, run our office here, I might add an office of one. So um, <laughs> the rest of my colleagues are based in San Diego where the mothership of Qualcomm is based, but always up in the Bay Area, obviously. This is where the hub of activity uh, is and the majority of our US-based in investments. Um, like uh, uh, a good sort of interesting element of Qualcomm Ventures is the international angle. Half of our team is based overseas. Uh, we have six international offices, Korea, India, China, Israel, UK, and recently Brazil. And we make investments from, again, um, very early stage, as low as 250K up to 10 to 15 million of its sort of growth capital. Um, we're a balance sheet fund, we work closely with all our business units, but effectively we make investments where we invest within the wireless domain, sort of in our wheelhouse, but uh, financially driven at the same time. So, 
Perfect. Thank you, Patrick. So, Jim. Yes, welcome everyone. I'm pleased to be here tonight. I'm uh, Jim Lucier and I'm Managing Director of Dell Ventures. I joined Dell about a year ago to set up and run Dell Ventures. Uh, prior to that, I was a general partner at Norwest Venture Partners for about a decade here in the Valley. Uh, prior to that, I ran Accenture's high-tech strategy practice for North America. And in between, I was general manager of a division of an e-commerce company selling software over the internet that went public called Beyond.com. I was attracted to Dell because uh, Dell's the company we all think of in that PC company in Texas. Not, every, <laughs> you know, not everyone knows that uh, Dell is in the middle of a transformation from being a hardware company to an end-to-end -end solutions company. Did I get cut off? You just maxed it out a little bit. I maxed it out. All right. So, so uh, you know, instead of just simply selling hardware, you know, software solutions to full stack end to end. And, um, you know, to do that, we've acquired 12 companies, or so, I'm sorry, 18 companies, $12 billion worth in the last three years in networking and storage and, and services and, uh, and so on. And what we decided to do is to complement that inorganic growth through acquisition with the venture investment capability. And that's, that's where Dell Ventures come in. So we're a strategic investor investing in areas that are relevant to Dell as we go through this transformation. We're investing in early to growth stage companies. Our check size is two to 15 million per round, averaging three to five million. And um, you know, in all the areas that are strategic to us, which are servers, storage, networking, cloud computing, uh, analytics and big data, security, systems management, and uh, mobility. So that's true. Thanks, Jim. So you, you, you guys are representing pretty much everything with a wide variety of different business models. In everything, it sounds like, except life sciences. Am I right on that? Yes. Okay, so pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So this is a very interesting panel that we have here. I've got a few questions to get them going, yeah. but I'd like to think that you would have questions for them, and I encourage you at any time to ask questions, and we'll see if we can get, get some answers for you. So just a couple of things to get the ball rolling. Um, why are so many corporations getting into corporate investing now? It seems that there's a new one coming up every week. Why is that? Who wants to pick that one up and run that? There, there you go. Well, <laughs> I'll start. Sure, um, so I, I, just speaking for IBM, um, you know, we, we have um, arguably the... The, the top, um, I think, maybe the, one of the only uh, captive R&D organizations still, or mainly R organizations um, uh, still in existence. And, um, and uh, you know, Nobel Prize winners, lots of great talent, but even they can't supply us with all of the innovation we need to, um, to really satisfy, you know, increasingly demanding customer set on a global basis. So we have to reach out to um, the innovation community, to entrepreneurs, uh, to find at the source this innovation that we can then tap and bring into IBM and kind of combine with, with what we do organically. So we think of the venture team, my team, as kind of a gearbox where we're constantly bringing together uh, external innovation together with what we do internally and kind of blending that together into solutions that hopefully result in great wins for us with our with our clients. Okay, is that true for others? Are you doing, doing the same models? I, I think so. I mean, I, I have my own opinions about what, you know, what the boom in corporate venture is. I mean, I, th I think not the least of which is probably the macroeconomic, you know, environment. It's really hard for big companies to innovate. And, um, you know, it's been harder and harder these last few years to find, you know, new sources of growth. Uh, so I think it's kind of a natural, a natural thing for large companies to do. Uh, City Ventures landed in the Valley. We, we're actually relatively young. We've been around for five years, uh, but the the uh, the group kind of relocated its headquarters to Palo Alto a couple of years ago to be more in the in the flow of what happens in Silicon Valley, which is pretty unique in the world, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, and we we actually get visited on a regular basis by a lot of other big companies who are looking to do the same. You know, we've mm -hmm. talked with Coke, we've talked with Ford, we've talked with you know, lots of other companies, some of our competitors are setting up, you know, in the financial services arena are setting up shop as well. So mm -hmm. it's definitely yeah. a trend. Yeah, uh, I think that's all good. We're trying to create some controversy here. <laughs> <laughs> that's all good, but I think there's another re reason that has not been mentioned by this, by this group. 
uh, which is that, are there any DCs in the audience here? Any? Okay. Uh, because corporate venture represents a superior model <laughs> <laughs> to venture capital. Uh, I, I say that somewhat tongue in cheek because I, I, at the beginning of my statement, I said that uh, uh, our model is to co-invest with other top tier VCs and we certainly feel like financial VCs bring a lot of value, no doubt about that. That said, entrepreneurs are increasingly recognizing that there's money and there's all the experience that a traditional VC brings, but what corporate VCs bring is more than money. So when you look at someone like Adele, you know, what we bring is 10 million business customers, right? And the access to all of those. We bring a brand that's global, and so a lot of our, a lot of small and medium-sized businesses, which are the target customer, will say, well, I haven't heard of Sequoia or Axel or Benchmark and any of those firms. I have heard of Dell. And so the kind of endorsement that you get from having Dell behind you or another, any one of these companies up here really helps the entrep entrepreneur be more successful. And then there are the kind of strategic programs that folks like us can offer around the table like OEM programs where we bring the product in and attach it to the millions of servers that we sell every year and companies that might have gone from five to 20 million on their own can go from five to 100 million with us or, or one of the folks here. And so I think there certainly is the need that we have as Dell and, and others to tap into that innovation as we transform, but there's also just the value that a corporate venture can bring, corporate venture group can bring in conjunction with a financial VC. So if, if I'm reading that right, it's not just money. You're, you're bringing access to customers, access to technology, access yeah. to marketing channels. All those things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally. And is the same true for you, Patrick? Yeah. I, I mean, to add to that, so I, mean, I, I guess it's no secret that traditional VC um, uh, funds are getting smaller. There's a dearth of capital on that side. And, and corporate venture funds are sort of picking up the ball. Um, However, I think where it gets a little dangerous, and maybe to be more controversial, is, is how corporate funds survive when there's a downturn or a bad quarter, right? So we had a cycle like this 10 years ago where there was a proliferation of funds, everyone's running something, uh, things go south, and you know, when there's pro rata um, calls or mm -hmm. to pick up uh, new financing rounds, um, a lot of corporate funds are either defunct, abandoned, etc. So um, we'll see in the next sort of downturn, and not, not to be pessimistic, but uh, at some point, I, I think uh, um, you know the test of time. Those funds that are disciplined, those funds that philosophically invest with sort of a consistent um, mandate, will uh, survive with the test of time. But also, when things are tough, not even a, a, a you know. A, an economic downturn, even a bad quarter. Well, that was a question. Yeah. You're leading up to a question that, that, that I did have here. That you know, corporate investor, investing has a track record of coming in late and investing late in the cycle. So, as we're seeing this explosion of corporate investing, should we start to panic now? Because <laughs> the cycle is about to, to end. Or, or tell me, go. what is going on? I, I mean, I, I don't know if. I, I don't know if I'm qualified to comment on that. I, I think you know you can read a lot of research that that just you know uh, documents the this you know cyclical nature of corporate venture capital. I do think that corporate venture has evolved and become a lot more sophisticated over the years. Um, uh, uh, some of you may know Heidi Mason. She runs Bell Mason Group. She's got a way that she describes this about we're in the fifth wave of of corporate venture. And um, you know we've gone through these these cycles, these mm -hmm. ups, you know kind of upswings and downturns. But the model is really evolving, and I personally feel like it's um, it's just really different than it used to be. So it is going to be different this time around. Well, I, know, I, think, I mean, I think it's going to be cycles, you know. But I I do think, um, and and I'm kind of in a different seat than I've been in before. I mean, my you know my whole history in the valley is more with technology companies like these guys that are to my left, and I find myself working for a bank, which is a New and different experience, but um, you know, I, I, you know, look. If you could argue there's almost nobody except for maybe the DMV that needs to innovate more than a big bank. There's all these traditional <laughs> antiquated things associated with the big bank, and it's it's a it's a real cultural transformation in addition to just you know growth uh, through innovation. And I, you know, I can't predict what's going to happen. It's a bad time for banks now. You know, interest rates are low. It's really hard to make money. 
Um, but, you know, we've got to innovate. I mean, I think, you know, we kind of feel like we've got to innovate or die. Um, we're going to get out-innovated by the little guys who are, you know, some of you who may be in the audience. So, I, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody, anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah, no, what I'll say is that um, the equity, the public equity markets go through cycles. And we've seen some wrenching cycles. Mm -hmm. Private equity goes through cycles. And we've seen some wrenching cycles in private equity. Venture capital itself, whether it's corporate or non-corporate, goes through cycles. And so, you know, it's not going to be different this time, I don't okay. think. Okay. Uh, and, and I think you're going to see cycles going, you know, taking place in corporate, corporate venture as well. Um, and they're not always happening at the same time. So there's ups and down cycles. And I think the real, the real question for, uh, uh, that I think about a lot is, as a newly minted corporate venture guy is that uh, in the up cycles, a lot of people do it in the down cycles, only some survive, right? And there are certain corporate venture groups that have stood the test, test of time and that have been around for 10, 20, and 30 years and longer. And you know, IBM's been doing this activity for a long time. You can look at Intel Capital and what they've achieved and you know, these are kind of the volume and the scale that they've got. And so it's really a matter of uh, not so much whether it's cyclical or not, but how the particular corporation does what they do. And there are some best practices that we're working hard to implement at Dell to really create a world-class venture capital capability that's going to be enduring and mission critical to Dell and mission critical to enabling the entrepreneurial community and an institution that we hope can be here for, you know, just like Intel and, and some of the others. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. To, to, to Jim's point, um, it's key to have sort of implement steady growth as opposed to ramp up a big team, throw money out, yeah. and, and, and just be sort of dumb strategic money. Um, core convention started about 10 years ago, not the most auspicious time, right, at essentially the trough of the, of the last uh, recession. And I think we maintained a steady growth. Um, deploying maybe 20, 30 million a year, now ramped up to about 75 million a year. Um, started with about three to four folks, now 19 globally. Uh, expanded our categories and investments we make, and, and uh, it's, it's about maintaining discipline and consistency. And I think the best funds survive over time okay. based on the sort of best practices. Great. Well, I was just gonna say, just back to your question about you know why um, why companies, more and more companies, uh, are kind of choosing to go and implement a, a corporate activity, a corporate venture activity. And part of it, I think, has to do also with globalization and the fact that, that you have to be able to, to think about your products and services as global products and services. Uh, and what better way than to kind of tap the, the entrepreneurial activity that's happening throughout the world and kind of use that to kind of get your over the horizon radar going and to see what's happening in those geographies and see which of those technologies you can bring back to operate here, but also to figure out you know, who you can partner with. If you're going into China and partnering is essential there, maybe you can establish some connections through your venturing activity there and you can move some of your products into China more readily than your competitors. So a lot of it has to do, I think, also with just this need to be global and the need to be able to reach out and access the global marketplace. Okay. And, and, and for each of you, what is the ideal way for a startup company looking to engage with you to make that engagement? What do you like to see? You're nodding your head there, so, so please. Have a yeah, I, I think one thing that's essential, uh, you know, is doing your homework. Um, so do as much homework as you can about understanding, you know, the firm that you're going to meet with and that you want to pitch. Um, you know, for City Ventures, we have a website. We publish our our portfolio companies on the website. We describe what we do. We describe sort of generally the areas that we're investing against. Um, so I, I think that's absolutely critical. Um, and I think it's, it's critical to look, to kind of do as much research as you can on just understanding what are the core businesses of, of that strategic. Um, so you can try to, you know, not just give your pitch like you're used to giving to everybody every day, but try to pitch it in the context of what might be relevant. I mean, for, uh, it's probably true for other big companies up here, you know, we, we're in a million businesses in, across the entire globe. Uh, on, at our city, you know, consumer retail banking through institutional commercial banking, and uh, you know, it's 
there's a, probably you know a dozen ways that your particular company and, and solution might fit into city or not, and you know you got to do a little of the legwork on your own to try to at least think about what those might be. You may not land in exactly the right direction, but that's probably the best advice I could give somebody. And, and, uh, what, what sort of stage do you like to see? Then? So we actually are stage agnostic at City Ventures, so we, we invest across stages, although I would say the majority of our investments have been Series A, Series B. Our most recent investment that you might have heard about is in a company called Square, um, so that was a later stage investment for us, but a, a very cool investment from our point of view. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we invest off the balance sheet. We don't, we don't disclose how much um, we invest in any given deal uh, or just generally how much we've allocated to invest. But um, let's suffice to say we're, we're good with capital. <laughs> 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 Believe it, whatever the government says. <laughs> Yours is a slightly different model. You're not investing in capital directly, but you do have yeah. partnership. You do offer an awful lot more. What yeah. sort of companies do you like to see? That what's that? Yeah, we like lots and lots of revenue. Uh, just, <laughs> just kidding. But... Um, yeah, we're in general. Um, we we really look for partnerships. So we're we're growing. We're, we're everybody says they're investing strategically. We really are because we don't invest capital. So we only have strategic. So we're really looking for partners who can help us drive our top line, but also in return we can help provide a, a route to market um, that is on a par with anybody in the world. I mean, um, I didn't talk about it before, but we go to market with seventeen verticals, 17 industry verticals across the gamut of, of IT, but in sectors like clean tech and uh, um, um, you know, of course banking, finance and healthcare and government. And, and so we're, we're really very broad, but what we look for really is, is as Deborah said, you know, do your homework and customize your presentation as if you really studied, you know, how you would fit in and add value to what we do. And, you know, we're going to be, if, if things work out, reselling in some way your solution. We're going to incorporate it into something we're doing or we're going to sell it as a part of something that we mm -hmm. sell to our customer. So one question to ask is, so why should our salespeople get excited about your thing and how is it going to help drive um, you know, that salesperson's quota or help them um, um, satisfy their customer uh, in, some, in some new way? And so doing that homework and kind of getting on board with, with, with how you can add value uh, is essential. But I also go the other direction and say, how can IBM add value to what you're doing? Because we're not, we don't think of ourselves as a VAR or some kind of a reseller uh, in, in explicit terms. We're looking to see where can we add value to what you're doing. And so if there's a good match where we're kind of exchanging mutual value, then that's the kind of thing that is, is really ideal for us. How, how many countries are you in and how many salespeople do you have? How many countries are there? I don't know. Probably 180 <laughs> countries or something. But uh, um, yeah, we're pretty much uh, all over the globe. And I um, mean, we're, we're doing, um, we have a, a, well, I'll say this for later, but we're doing a lot of entrepreneurial activities in emerging markets um, all over the world. I mean, not just China and India, Brazil, but places like uh, Eastern Europe and Turkey and, and places like that. And so we really are looking for, we're hungry for solutions, you know, everywhere. So if there's a startup company out here that wants to go global, these guys can get you that much. So. Absolutely, but the requirement though, we put back on the entrepreneur is they've got to have a, a, a technology or solution that can scale on a global basis. And I think that separates really the, the, the wheat from the chaff is, is you know, great, it works in the lab, but will it work at scale? And if you think about the kind of companies we represent here, we're all talking big scale here. And so that's really the test. And I think that's an advantage that, again, going back to your corporate question, that corporates can add over traditional VC is that we can help you scale. We know scale like nobody else. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah. Patrick. I think to, to reiterate what Deborah and Andrew said, I, I think it comes down to fit. I mean, first of all, we are very thesis driven in the way we invest. Uh, we, uh, a discussion um, will flourish if the, if the company does their homework and understands that we have thesis in crowdsourcing using handsets as sensors. Um, if, if they understand, we have a thesis called invisible internet with apps running in the background. We're very contrarian in that we've backed a lot of Android first apps, very rare. Um, we look at a lot of mobile first businesses that are disruptive to sort of traditional um, incumbents. So uh, harness the power in the post-PC era. 
a lot of that is sort of thesis driven. Um, and likewise, we want to show that there's fit and value that we bring. So we bring tremendous sort of credibility and halo effect, not only relationship, 200 plus carriers, 300 plus OEMs all over the world, but uh, bring tons of engineering acumen, access to early hardware, um, uh, a, a sneak peek at roadmaps, what's going to be sort of um, interesting, not only 18, 24 months away, which a lot of OEMs and, and fundamentally what Qualcomm looks at, but we try to sort of bridge the gap with developers or startups that think six months in advance. So a lot of that is serving as a conduit from the business unit that's talking to Samsung um, about 24 months away where a developer is only interested in the next three to nine months. So we bridge that gap and, and, and help sort of facilitate those relationships as well as, and I'm sure all my peers here know that our organizations are very streamlined, um, navigate the bureaucracy, right? Who to talk to, who can help you out, who should you avoid? Is that real, is that a pet project? Um, you know, are they gonna zap you or, or, um, it, or, the, or fundamentally are they trying to outsource R&D? We can help that. We have to be careful because um, fundamentally I wear, you know, Qualcomm hat at the end of the day, but um, we can bring value in many different, many different ways. Yeah, so we, we invest in sort of three different scenarios. And so when you think about how to approach us, think about what of the three scenarios you may fit. One is uh, we're looking to invest in technologies that are so disruptive that they could put one of our existing businesses out of business or put one of our competitors' business out of business. That's one scenario. Very disruptive technologies. Those tend to be early stage. There's other, another scenario is where um, there's, there's an area that we, we believe is of interest to us to expand into, to extend our core business into, yet it's relatively undeveloped. The technology is relatively unproven. It's relatively early. If we were to try to make an acquisition in that space, we'd either crush the company or, you know, again, it may not work mm -hmm. out. And so it's a potential area of strategic interest on a path to partnership or on a path to acquisition. And then there's another scenario, which is where it's something that we're not ever going to do. Uh, but yet, because we have a channel or because we've got the scale that we have, we can partner with that company and drive their revenue. So as you think about, uh, as you think about your business and think about which ones of those scenarios you might well fit into, uh, if it's one of those disruptive technologies, do not go to the business because no one in our business is going to fund something that's going to put them out of business, right? Come to me. <laughs> you know, you know, come to me. On the other hand, uh, if, it, if it's something that is either something we, that's a partnership potential or something that is a, an area of interest that may eventually become a partnership or an acquisition, you want to work with us, but just as importantly, Work with the business and think about that story of how do you fit in. It, it's a little bit like what both what all of you have been saying here is, what is the unique value that you can bring to Dell's business, and think about the value that Dell's business can bring to you. There's there's certain companies that we're just not going to be able to help as much as others, and so think about that match. And a lot of times, uh, if it's in that one, that category two or three, I'll ask you, who have you been talking to at Dell already? Who do you know already? And kind of get your way in there so that the relationship is a long, pretty far along. Because it's sometimes very difficult to go from a cold start with the venture group. And I send it over to somebody you know, in our security group or in our server group. They've never heard of you. It can take weeks and months. And your funding need probably is within three months. Right, so think about the cycles of when you, you know, when you need your funding and ideally engage as early as possible with an idea of how you can help that business unit. Again, unless it's disruptive, right? And then come to me. Okay. <laughs> come to me anyway, and I'll plug you in to those people. But, uh, so you've got many different models, many different in in industries yeah. here, with the exception of life science. So plenty of opportunities here. It sounds like the su support services they can provide for you actually have more value than the money they can give you. Geez, to have a global sales force. Wow, that's huge value. Any questions from this, this panel? There's got to be some questions. Yes, ma'am. I would be curious. Um, earlier, you were mentioning how um, the world of venture or corporate venture has really changed in terms of the, just the business. And I would just be curious as to what, what it is that you see as being different or evolving. 
Okay, the, the, the evolving business? I'll, I'll take a stab. Um, I mean, you know, from my point of view, uh, and, and I, I haven't been on the investment side in my career, I tend to, um, to come from the incubation or growing new business in, inside of large organizations, but usually alongside um, colleagues who are investing, taking equity investments in startups. And I think, you know, I don't know, seven, ten years ago, uh, corporate venture firms, again, my perception, there was, you know, investment, but not a lot of other activity. Investment usually primarily for financial return. And sometimes there might be an introduction to some part of the business, um, but that was about where things stopped. And, and, you know, I think you've heard everybody up here describe a much more, a much richer, more sophisticated kind of engagement model. And I think uh, I've heard most of us describe ourselves as somewhat strategic investors. For City Ventures, I can say that we have a very deliberate um, mandate for ourselves that we, we try to commercialize with at least 50% or more of our portfolio companies. So, and when, we, when I say commercialize, what I mean is we're, we consider ourselves strategic investors. We're not trying to lose money. We want to make money. So we, we always are looking at the financial merits of a business model and a venture. But, you know, we're fundamentally looking for partnership. You know, we're not, we're not big acquirers. Um, we're looking to partner with our portfolio companies either as technology suppliers, so we invest a lot in security and fraud detection kinds of technologies, other emerging technologies, uh, infrastructure and technology infrastructure is arguably one of those areas where banks have underinvested. Certainly, I think Citibank has, um, but we also invest in you know other areas that are more relevant to our, our customer-facing businesses, and so. We're looking to bring companies in. I, I mentioned our investment in Square. We're actively in, in discussions with Square about, you know, how can we partner with them and create new solutions for, for example, small business lending that take advantage of their capabilities in addition to ours. So that's kind of what I was referring to earlier when I said I thought venture had sort of evolved. Jim, you, you were a, a, a con conventional VC in yeah. the past 10 years. What changes have you seen for being the other side of the desk and now in that seat? Well, some of it's the people doing it, right, that were on the other side of the desk and then now are on the corporate side of the desk, right? I think that um, there's, you know, there's a certain way that deals get done in the Valley and in, in the VC world, and, and I think there were a lot of folks that maybe in the past got into corporate venture through an M&A path or a strategic planning path mm -hmm. or something else and really just didn't understand venture syndicates and how they work together and board responsibilities and strategic terms and, and all of that. So I think it's just become much more um, much more sophisticated and, and much more consistent with the entrepreneurial process as it's evolved mm -hmm. over time. Okay, anybody else want to comment on that? Okay, any, any oh, loads of questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> you um, when you invest in a company, how do you structure the deal to protect your future interests from <coughs> Ooh, How do you structure a deal to protect Sorry, yourself what, what from Typical technique. From future? From a competitive buyout. From a competitive buyout, okay. Anybody want to pick on it? Nobody wants to pick yeah, no, on it. You don't protect yourself? <laughs> no, no, I'll take a crack at it. Um, I'd say the earlier it is where you're just there to learn, the less you're concerned about it, right? When you're not adding a tremendous amount of strategic value, that's fine. You're learning, you're getting your learning, if someone else buys it, great, you know? But the more that you start to engage around adding value to the, to the company and, and, and investing your own resources, your own channel, your own brand, and so on, um, there, is, there is an interest in, in doing, you know, doing something to make sure that you're able to um, do, have an opportunity to maintain that value, have an option to maintain that value. And so there's, there's something that we don't do that probably, and this is another reason that corporate, how that corporate ventures change, there are a lot of Corporations used to ask for something called a right of first refusal. Mm -hmm. And a right of first refusal, as on the other side of the table, I'd say that's like a way of buying a company without buying it, right? Because anybody else that makes an offer on the company, you get to match it at the last minute. We don't do that, okay? But what we do do sometimes is to say, and I, and I actually believe this is in the company's interest as well as in Dell's interest, is a right of first notice, right? So that in the event that we have added a lot of value to your company and a competitor comes along and buy it, wants to buy it, we have a period of time. We get notice that a transaction has been offered and we have a period of time to respond and make our own offer. And what this does is actually encourages Dell or whoever else has that right to put their best foot forward immediately 
right? And what it ends up often doing is creating an auction uh, where, where the investors in the company can do better than if that right wasn't there. I think you're pointing out, though, one of the, the big risks is in, in corporate investing is this, this issue. Uh, the reason that, one of the reasons that we don't um, invest capital directly is because we have kind of kicked up our, our M&A activity um, in recent years. And when we are an acquirer, we don't want to be an owner in that same category. Uh, we'd like to objectively judge the set of companies that we're looking at uh, with kind of, um, you know, un unfettered by, by being a minority owner. And uh, also, when you're a large company with multiple divisions, like all of us are, um, you can have the left hand not really coordinated with the right hand, and you can be an owner in, in a, a company, and then your other division comes along and, and acquires their competitor, and then you look kind of, uh, well, I don't know what we're doing here. And so um, uh, we just find it's much simpler just to avoid the problem there. And so I think that there are solutions that you know, are going to be custom fit to each, each organization, you know, what works best for them. Um, but I think that some of the risks are, as you, as you, as you state. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, I think that's a very good question and, and one to grapple with in terms of risk considerations of accepting sort of corporate or strategic money. Uh, philosophically, we don't invest to acquire. Uh, I think of the 120 plus investments over the past decade, we've acquired one and we overpaid for that, so probably the investors were happy. <laughs> um, uh, but when you, um, you, you want to avoid the perception, and it's not always the case, of being a, a captive investor where you artificially limit liquidity options going forward. Yeah. So any term sheet with onerous language, I think right of first notice is, is fine. Um, as Jim mentioned before, right of first offer, uh, sorry, right of first refusal, um, that's, a, that's a very slippery slope and should be probably a non-starter. Um, if you have other options, um, but any other tricks or, you know, we, um, we're big proponents of very clean term sheets. Um, it, if there's some non-standard language, occasional we'll propose, whether it's uh, correlated with value creation, I don't know, you could hypothetically have some warrants that if you bring X value, you receive more. Um, but we were of the belief that clean as possible um, and I'd say that's probably 90% of the time. There are exceptions, um, but it's one of the perils of, you know, just, just the trade-off of accepting corporate or strategic money. And uh, I think that's, the onus is on both sides to have an open conversation and, and the entrepreneur would understand some of the, some, some the trade-offs as well. Yeah, I'll just add briefly, I mean, I, again, I'm not on the investment side, so I don't write the term sheets, but I, I know my two colleagues who do write the term sheets, they believe in clean term sheets. And, you know, I, I think because they came from VC and now they're corporate VC, you know, they would never, they would never want, you know, a first right of refusal clause in there. But what we, you know, how, how we try to differentiate or protect against our competitors are by being the best partners to those startups and their other investors. So, as I said, you know, we have a um, high bar on ourselves to commercialize with our portfolio companies, and we feel like that's our competitive differentiation in the market. If if, if startups and entrepreneurs and other investors know that we're really trying to bring value to that company because we see the value that company can bring to us, that's going to benefit everybody in, in the ecosystem. That's actually an outside a very big change that I've seen. Because it used to be that all corporates had the right of first refusal in there. That was that was the standard, and that's that change. That's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Makes it yes, sir. I'm curious as startups come to you for their different needs. Some of them just want business development. Some of them want business development with NRE. Some of them want uh, strategic investment. Investment obviously is a long-term process, and it's like getting married. But on the other hand, if they only want to date you, you send them over to another group that you work, you, you know, you, uh, the sister group, or do you field those kinds of inquiries as well, and then you figure out a way to sort of guide them through the corporation? Is that anyone in particular? Or? No, I think, well, I don't know. Well, I'll start. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's kind of our model. I mean, we're, we see ourselves as the entry point for entrepreneurs and, and, and for VC backed companies as well, um, you know, who want to uh, find their way in. And so part of my day job really is to help figure out where to route them. And some of them we'll work with and kind of mentor and, uh, and, uh, and guide ourselves. Um, others will want to send, depending on where they are in their life cycle, want to send on to a business unit and mow the recommendation. 
Um, still others, maybe we uh, set up something working with a, uh, um, with a research unit or something. So we, we have a kind of a triage process where we... So you don't do investments, so that applies to you, yeah. and that applies to the other people. Yeah, but, but it's essentially the same, though. It's kind of figuring out the best path for that entrepreneur. And I, I would say um, this is one area in which, you know, I, I like the model that we have at City Ventures where we combine, you know, not just corporate venture capital, but also incubation and just a broader innovation agenda. Um, you know, uh, I think Patrick was talking about being kind of thesis focused in, um, as their investment um, philosophy, and we do the same at City Ventures. Um, my colleagues on the investment side had, have a set of focus areas that include you know, some not surprising topics like big data, security, mobility, um, that kind of thing, you know, data analytics. Um, we have uh, domains, strategic domains, that we uh, use to drive uh, kind of our project selection for incubation. And, and so often we will do what we call smart experiments with small companies that have some interesting technology or capability to bring to bear in an area that we're already strategically interested mm -hmm. in. Sometimes those companies um, are already portfolio companies. Sometimes they are not portfolio companies and they become portfolio companies and sometimes they're just companies that we partner with. So, you know, I, I like that kind of um, fluidity, if you will, between um, those two parts of our model. Great answer, So, you had a question? Yeah, so at the onset, uh, Chris, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chris and Anthony for to put, to put across uh, such a fantastic panel. And uh, we are glad to kind of you know, have you guys here. Uh, my question is with reference to uh, the panel being concurring on the fact that uh, knowledge capital is as much important as financial capital when you provide to entrepreneurs. And uh, <coughs> so that, that's, that's one side of the paradigm. But on the other side, what would you say, or what would you have to say to all those entrepreneurs who are so passionate about their businesses and say that, you know, here's the money, you know what to do. You know what I mean? So th this is, the question is, what do you do with an entrepreneur who just says, just give me the money, I don't need anything else to it, isn't that right? We are, we, are, we are glad to have the kind of services. With the we like everything else, yeah, just give us the money. Show me the money and then yeah. I know what to do because I, I know what, what the business is. What, what do you have to say for us? So what's your reaction to the, just give me the money? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I go back to when, you know, when I was on the other side of the table, through financial VC, that's a red flag. Right, and it's the same thing in a corporation, in a corporate setting as well, because um, what a lot of entrepreneurs sometimes forget is that whether you're taking capital from a financially oriented VC or a strategically oriented VC or a corporation or whatever, what you're really doing is taking on a partner, and you're selling some ownership in your company, and you're giving up some rights, and you're giving up some control, and so. What I heard in your question was, we know what to do, give us the money and leave us alone. That's kind of the wrong, <laughs> that's, that's a red flag. And so we, we generally would just say, you know, there may be someone else that's a better fit for you that wants to be. Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> uh, it's very expensive money, whether you're getting it from the, the you know, institutional side or the corporate side. And, and there may be other options, such as angel or other kind of investing that's more suited to that kind of a request, but probably not any of us. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's great businesses that don't have to be venture-backed, right? Yeah. Lifestyle businesses. Uh, Most uh, software Yeah, companies. to Andrew's point, it, it, this is expensive capital, whether it comes from traditional VCs, corporate, and it comes with hooks. And, and even <laughs> even from a, uh, just, just, from a practical point of view, we have Sarbine Oxley compliance that we need to monitor and have access. So um, it's just, I, I think fundamentally there's a mismatch there and, and by nature all of us are sort of collaborative in the way we invest and I think that is indeed sort of a, a, a red flag. I understand what you know, you're, you're saying, but there's, there's many other sources of, of capital and corporate funding probably, probably not for them. So you have to at least tell them that you're going to listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you really want? A facade. Yeah, Perhaps yeah, just yeah. play a little, yeah. Say some questions. buzzwords, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Question for Andy Park. Um, we've been successful with multiple phase one and SBIR and NIH grants to develop uh, aging in place applications, uh, mostly all the technology based. Uh, we're always looking for collaborate, collaboration. rolling out beta tests. Unfortunately, what we find sometimes with the larger corporate environments is the 
time to actually react and respond to, especially during that submission process, the NIH is problematic. Do you have a process where you've gone through that or sorted out that, that, uh, that time frame? As you probably know, the, the NIH submission process is three times a year. If you miss it, you've got a long time for the next submission. Yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not directly familiar with that process, but I am familiar with, with lots of other processes, say in government and other parts of healthcare, or drug discovery and life sciences. And yeah, there, there are a lot of, almost every industry actually, you can look at a set of regulatory and other processes that, that require a good deal of, of expertise to navigate. Um, so I have to say that, that, you know, in many of those, we are very experienced in that and we do have horses in those races at any given time. And so depending on the fit of your, of your uh, technology or, or, or process with something that we're bidding on or working with, then we could certainly accelerate that and get into that process. That's the advantage actually. Another advantage of a corporate is that we're in those processes and we know those processes because we, we kind of have to, that's our world. And so uh, procurement processes, um, um, I mean, try the DOD. Uh, you know, some of those are, are multi-year processes. So, so we understand those, and I think that um, you know, for the right fit, we can help you uh, a great deal. I think. I think I see some hands in the back. So, yes, yeah, the person back there. The, yes. Um, so I think, if I'm wrong, I think Patrick's made clear that they're financial first, strategic second, based on that acquisition staff. Is that accurate? Yeah, I, Sorry, I, I, I would I, I wouldn't say they're mutually exclusive for us. We 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 are driven financially, but we invest in what we know best. So there is sort of a strategic threshold, but we're not we're not restricted by having a commercial agreement or business unit partnership or better yet sponsorship. So I don't, does that clarify? Sorry. To, to a degree, I think okay. the question is, is Sandra Brown, do you guys ever feel pressure from the mothership to pursue a business and you find yourself overpaying? Sometimes you're saying, well, it's strategic, so an extra 20% of the free money is fine. Do you ever find yourself in that situation, um, especially since you have kind of that, that big brother behind you that's writing the checks? Do you think they're really going to tell you, Bill Putty? <laughs> 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 do you find yourself in that situation with those stats, you know? Uh, I'll try to crack at that. I wouldn't say we find ourselves in that situation like, you know, whatever the price is, we'll pay 20% more yeah. because we're strategic. But I, I, you know, one of the subtleties that you find is, you know, having been in a purely financially oriented VC, there's a set of set of investments that you make that would be a set of things you'll consider, and there's a cutoff point, right? And things below the cut, you just don't look at. Whereas, if there's something that helps the business, you might consider making an investment where you you you'll, you're you're you're, you're going to look to make a good return. But it would not, you know, maybe in a, in a traditional VC firm, it might not make the cut. Uh, I'll just say it that way. Uh, and so it's a good investment and that the, when you take the financial return, which has got to be there uh, and above our hurdle rates and all that, and you combine it with a strategic return that's going to help the business in some other way that's measurable, right? More revenue on another side of the P&L, more profits drop the bottom line. We will consider those investments more frequently than in, a, in, a, in a, a, a traditional VC. That's right. There's a question over here. For, yes, sir. Yeah, just a quick three-part question for three of the four candidates. Um, what do you think? <laughs> will you leave, and do you require a commercial relationship? What was the first? Very clear. What was the first one? Will you leave round? Will you take a board seat, and do you require a commercial relationship? Okay. For City Ventures, uh, we don't leave. Um, we set, we often take board seats, but we sometimes take advisor seats. Um, it has to do with the capacity of the team, I think, to, to fully participate as, as a board member. And I forgot the third What's one. What's the other one? Commercial relationship. Commercial relationship. We don't require it, as, as I described earlier. We're really keen to do that, and we, and we think that's part of um, our value add to the, to the entrepreneur and, and their other investors, as well as the city. Let's move down the table. I, I know Drew doesn't. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, no. <laughs> so, uh, um, we will leave. Uh, it's, it's not our preference. I would say a ballpark maybe of, of the deals out there um, will probably lead 20-25% of them. Um, again, if we feel, if we have real conviction about it and we think we have to step up, we will lead. But again, it's not necessarily our preference. Board seats is, is, uh, is a delicate manner, um, particularly being 
um, uh, you know, corporate issues and liabilities. Um, it's we will take a board seat if we lead the round, but again, probably less of a preference. Um, I would say there are 83 active, 82, 83 active portfolio companies. We probably only have a half dozen board seats. Um, and then in terms of commercial agreement, no, but it, um, it, it, it makes a world of difference if we have internal support to, to sort of get it through our, our process. Generally not, generally not, and no. <laughs> you know, so we can lead, but we don't, it's not, uh, we don't, we, we, we prefer to, to join an existing syndicate. We are able to take board seats, but we prefer not to, and, and we don't need a commercial relationship. Okay. Any more questions? Yes, sir. I just want to quickly follow up, Patrick, and your comment about uh, not uh, investing to acquire. First, I just wanted to get a sense from the rest of the panel that that's a thesis of shame. Um, and if it is, then I just want to double click further and say, so I'm at HP, similar size business as many of you here, leading an emerging business. You invest a lot in a partner, you educate the sales force, you can't confuse 5,000 people with investing in one and then buying another and partnering with a third. You pick one. Uh, and so how does that play out? Did you get that? I don't know why I go first because I'm so much less efficient than my colleagues are here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to wait. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I gave, I'll try. I, mean, I gave the three scenarios. One is where it's an early technology uh, disruptive, so we don't have any intention. We don't even know whether it's going to pan out, so there it's not an issue. It, it's, there's where it's a potential extension of our core that's on a path to partnership or acquisition. We don't go into it knowing that we're going to acquire. We don't go into it knowing that we're going to a partner. We invest in it to learn and then see what path it takes, right? Um, and and so um, and then the third path is where we've already decided it's a partnership from the beginning. That you know clearly that one's very much more straightforward. But I guess to answer your question, no, we don't. We we're not against acquiring something we've invested in. We don't explicitly exclude. We don't, we, you know, we, so I, I think I've answered it. I would say even though we don't invest capital directly, um, as a practice, we don't view our activities as kind of auditioning for acquisition either. I mean, we have, we have a corporate uh, uh, M&A group. We have um, uh, teams in each of our brands who are very good at that. Sometimes we're approached to help generate a short list of potential acquirers in a certain space or maybe help in the due diligence process, but we don't go after, we don't wake up every day thinking, I'm gonna go find you know, a company that does this. Um, uh, that's, you know, maybe out of um, several hundred that we partner with, there's one that uh, we end up acquiring in a space. So it's, it happens so infrequently that we're just focused on, as you said, partnerships. And just one follow-up just to, because it's, it's not necessarily binary with us, so we don't invest or acquire, but that's not saying that we don't run parallel tracks. So occasionally we'll look to invest, and I wouldn't say there's a Chinese wall with our M&A group, but they will run a separate process, um, and it's very um, more efficient that way, and we will, uh, we, we just don't invest because, the invest or acquire thinking that we can get it on the cheap later or have access. Uh, a savvy um, target will just, Include a premium there, the twenty percent premium. Of the yeah. Yeah. I mean, right? You're not buying options. It's not a, a publicly traded company. Yeah, um, if you, yeah. If I was to say, if you really think about it, it's almost counterproductive yeah. to to combine those two threats because you're looking for, you know, a, a reasonable valuation, not to jack it up with expectations. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, in, in terms of my next thought, um, yeah, we. Um, and it's also not to say that we haven't evaluated, our M&A group has not evaluated existing portfolio companies. That happens occasionally as well. Um, and we have to be very careful in terms of the um, information flow and thinking in the best interest of our investment. So it's, it's, it's a very delicate process and oftentimes we recuse ourselves, remove, um, and, and finally, um, uh, to, you know, again, it's philosophical, it's, it's, it's it's, it's the way we invest, and it's not necessarily right or wrong. Other companies have been very successful um, with, with, with the investor acquirer philosophy. So. There's a question down there, yes, sir. What are the hard metrics, not soft metrics, but hard metrics that you use to measure the success of the CVC? 
I can start. Um, I mean, we obviously track, uh, we track, I guess what I call operational metrics, like how many companies we meet with and you know the, the, how the beginning of the funnel kind of goes down to the smaller, much smaller number uh, that we ultimately invest in. But we, we track the valuation of, of the companies uh, at, at funding events, essentially, or any other kind of event. Um, and then we have hard metrics around our commercial activities that I described earlier. So because we're explicitly um, investing to partner, um, not to acquire, we're a highly regulated entity, so there's other hurdles associated with the bank acquiring companies. It's not out of the realm of possibility, but you know, we're, we're really looking to deliver value to, to city and city customers through those partnerships with our portfolio companies. So we track, um, we track you know, which, the number of our portfolio companies with whom we have active commercializations, and for each of those commercializations, we track kind of a scorecard, you know, red, yellow, green, how's it going? Um, there are specific metrics about whatever it is that we're trying to do with that portfolio company, and, and we monitor kind of what we thought the hypothesis was going in and what the actual results were as, it, as we go through. And, do that. Anybody else can I pick on that one? Apparently not. Any other question? Uh, yes, sir. You. How are you different from the conventional VCs? How do you differ from conventional VCs? I thought we covered a lot of that already, but um, if you want to have a little bit to that. Uh, we haven't been on both sides. I mean, one thing is the decision process is very different, right? So, you know, VC partnership, there's Monday meetings and you kind of present and the partner sponsors the deal and you work it through and you get a decision and it's funded, right? Uh, and um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in most corporations, there's there's a little more of an extended process, at least certainly at Dell, where this is a relatively new activity and we're looking for um, you know, uh, approval from a business unit president, uh, uh, our CFO generally, and our head of strategy corporate development. And so, it can take a little longer to get through that process. That's one big difference. Roughly how, how, how long might it take? Uh, well, I mean, but believe it or not, uh, sometimes it's better. Sometimes the approvals happen over email, you know, because you've got, uh, you know, CFO of a $62 billion company, and he's like, you know, this is a $3 million investment. Yeah, I approve, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, um, you know, that but said. Those of you looking for less than $3 million. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, oh, it, it, it varies, but I, I think it's maybe if it's four to eight weeks for a traditional VC, right? It might be, you know, six to 12, something like that for us. Okay. Anybody else want to comment on that? No? All right. Mm -hmm. There's a question at the back. Yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> could you uh, just say anything about the um, uh, public market, uh, you know, divulgence requirements that you might have on a company that you invest in? Is the name enough, or do they need to know the, the type of business that they're involved in? Did I? Yeah. Did you get that? Did, did that Pardon, can you clarify that again? If, yeah. if you invest in, if you invest in a, a company, a startup, then uh, what types of information do, does the public market need to know from about that investment and, and when? Do you have any requirements as a public company yeah. to disclose Disclosures, that? yeah, let's talk about disclosures. Hmm. Yeah. It's got to be material, yeah. right? And so, you know, Dell, 62 billion, I mean, there's nothing that we would look at that would be material from a venture standpoint, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, it's booked at cost. Um, that's probably another, another difference between traditional VC and corporate VC. The accounting is much more uh, conservative. But with respect to disclosure, unless it, you know, exceeds a certain materiality threshold, like 10% of revenue or something, I, I don't think any of us yeah. are investing at that level. Of, I hope or not, um, because <laughs> then, then they give they give us too much control. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. and then I would just add, you know, Citibank highly regulated banking entity, so we have a lot of regulatory and compliance hurdles that we have to satisfy. Um, but uh, to my knowledge, again, with the caveat that I'm not on the investment side, um, I don't think we have any like disclosure things. Yeah. Well, I mean, one interesting spin on that question is, I think, from risk management, right? We have, you know. We all represent companies with massive po big pockets and we become targets. So I think there's a lot of sort of risk management and um, uh, obviously our, our, our you know, fund friendly group of lawyers get involved and uh, you know, go through the docs um, um, at, a, at, you know, at a very detailed level. Um, but it, it's more risk management as opposed to PR and disclosure. One last question, the gentleman at the back there. If, if you don't leave the road, 
How do you get invited to, to the party? Well, that's a good one. If you don't lead the round, how do you get invited to the party? <laughs> Uh, well, I'll, I'll start, um, you know, one of the smartest things I think City Ventures did was uh, bring in two investment colleagues from the VC world. So we have a gentleman from, uh, formerly from Battery uh, Ventures and another one from Menlo Ventures, both, I think, 10-year partners at those firms. Uh, one of them also, the guy who's at Menlo is also at Intel Capital. So we have professional investors. They have their own network. Um, we've had the privilege of investing alongside, you know, Kleiner Perkins, Andreessen Horowitz, um, you know, a lot of uh, Excel, a lot of uh, top tier VCs, and I think uh, I think the way that the team uh, has been successful is by trying to add value back into the network here, you know, and, and, and largely through what I have described as our commercialization process, but. You know, giving good feedback to the entrepreneurs that we meet with, even including the hundreds that we haven't invested in, and you know, being transparent, trying to be as fast as we can and as nimble as we can uh, for being part of a big entity. So did, did, did you get calls from VC saying, hey, we're just too bad to invest in these people, we've got to get, we think it's a good world for you, do you want to help us fill out the round? I think, you know, I, I don't know exactly, I mean, but, you know, we meet regularly with all the, okay. with, with top VCs, I mean, I, I think, you yeah, know, that's, I, I personally think for, you know, having grown up in the Valley, City Ventures landing here two years ago and to be able to invest alongside some of those firms that I, that I mentioned, I think that s says a lot to um, the way that we're being um, perceived and welcomed mm -hmm. into, the, into the Valley. So. I would say the same thing. I mean, even though we're not as part of a formal syndicate, obviously, um, we're on the speed dial of um, about 150 VCs that we work with and, and uh, we get calls um, actually increasingly before the deal, uh, helping with their due diligence or helping with, uh, with uh, sourcing a piece of information or do we know the, the, the CEO or whatever. Uh, but we're definitely on the speed dial for, hey, we just put $3 million in, we need you to you know, introduce the, uh, the, the CEO to your head of your retail or CPG unit or whatever. So, so we find that that's, that's how you get invited is just you just bring value. And, and it really has to do with either, either what we talked about today on the panel, the, the, the corporate value you can bring, access to clients and access to all of these things, um, matters a lot to um, traditional VCs who, who have a certain set of skills, but it may not include some of the things that we bring. Patrick, you? Yeah, I mean, one thing to add, uh, I, I agree with uh, Deborah and Andrew, but, um, you know, about two years ago, we were boxed out of a few Series A deals because we didn't lead, or we got boxed out because there wasn't enough for us to come in. Um, and we started our C, sort of early Series A program that was able to um, accelerate the timing anywhere from two to four weeks of from meeting to actually funding based on, you know, very thesis driven, knew the entrepreneur, mm -hmm. but those were ways that we could get in at a very early stage and then reserve a, a seat at the table going forward. Um, we've had many of those graduate to really marquee or sort of club Series A deals that we have significant ownership. I wouldn't say you know, we're still minority investors, high single digits, low teens, but deals that we were not we would not be invited to if, if that's what because at the Series A level it is very competitive, and you know corporate funds have a stigma um, at that early stage. Whether it's it's fair or not, there is a signaling effect with corporate funds being you know investing at, at Series A. It's 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 very tough and challenging. Hence the reason we, we felt the need to move upstream. And time will tell. We're making a lot of bets. Our risk tolerance is higher, and we're spreading it around. We've probably made 16 seed investments for the last two years all across the world. There's a lot of, there's a lot of entrepreneurs that want to work with Dell and the other companies that are up here. There's a lot of VCs that see the value as well. There's some that don't. But there's enough around that um, I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble keeping up with my, <laughs> with my email and my inbox. But one thing that we do sometimes that you may not think of where we help a company is, um, I'll give you an example. They're, we're very interested in software and fine networking and we came across a company that looked promising and we actually took the software into our lab and ran it head to head against uh, F5 load balancers up to 10 gigabits and we had the performance and it was the same and so we were, you know, not very many VCs are gonna do that and so we actually helped this company. We made introductions to other VCs and said, you know, We've got this running in our lab and it works and this is an area we're interested in and you know if you guys want to talk to the engineers that ran those tests you can and so i mean that's been 
that tremendous value, and that's why we get invited into, into some of these. Okay. We're running out of time, so uh, one last nugget of, of, of input or advice for people in the room to help connect with corporate venture capital and leverage those partnerships and um, great things apart from the money that you have. If you, Jim, do you want to excuse me? Uh, I, the gentleman left, but I was just thinking about the question about, well, you know, you guys only, you know, if, if it's not an investment, how do we, how do you, how do you help? And, and, and we, I guess the answer is, you know, even if it's not something that Dell is going to invest, Dell Ventures is going to invest in, if it's a potential partnership, we do our best to connect you with the business. And so let us know and, and we'll, we'll plug you in and maybe someday we'll become an investment opportunity. And I can't guarantee that we'll get it to the right person or the introduction that we make is going to pan out, but you know, we're there to, to help. Yeah, I mean, I think that's very true. We wear a business development hat as well. I mean, most of, most of the day we're saying no to investment opportunities, but it's, 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 it's very important for us to think of the bigger picture, not only business potential partnerships and, and help them navigate, sort of Qualcomm and make introductions, but also it's, it's very relationship driven. Um, I think to Jim's point, uh, many investments that we've made, we've initially declined or they didn't make sense at the time. So oftentimes it's about fostering that relationship and then 12, 18 months down the road, um, when it makes a lot more sense, it's a much more natural conversation. Um, and if, and if, if it's already been vetted by the business unit, we've helped them out. Um, we've already sort of demonstrated you know, the ability to create value and, and they trust us and it's, it's a more natural fit at that point. Drew? Yeah, we have the uh, same kind of thing. Uh, we've got uh, uh, what we call frameworks uh, in every one of our verticals and across the board. And these are, these are essentially uh, toolkits with APIs and all kinds of tools to help you kind of demonstrate the value of what you're doing against kind of a, an opportunity that's going to maybe one day run in a place like City Bank. And so the idea is, is, you know, get your technology working with our stuff and then you've got a platform to kind of really make your case and show it off. And a lot of that, all of it is free of charge to entrepreneurs. So come see us at one of our innovation centers and we'll fix you up. And you've got a local innovation here. So we Bank. got one in San Mateo where you can come in and you can just work with our stuff. Wow, cool. Yeah. We don't have that, but... Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, there you go. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll just, uh, not to reiterate anything, I mean, we talked earlier about the importance of doing your homework, and, and I think that is really important. But I think, you know, last year, City Ventures met with something like 600 plus startups and VCs, wow. and we invested in eight. And, um, but I, you know, speaking on behalf of my investment colleagues, we really value your thought leadership. You know, we're, part of the reason that we're investing is also to, to spot trends and, and to glean, you know, insights from um, all the cool uh, innovative work that's going on outside of city and outside of our industry. And, and so we're, we're not only interested in your pitch and, and like your best articulation of how you think that fits with what, what our different businesses are, um, but also in your, your hypotheses about you know, where, where market is going or technology is going that might be interesting to us because a huge part of, of what we do is, is really try to pay attention to the, you know, the fringes of what's going on and, and, interpol and, and interpret how that's relevant to the city's future strategically and how we should think about it. So bring your insights along with your pitch and your homework. True. I think you're a very open panel, so please join me in giving them a round of applause. <laughs>